All right, so now that we've uh, kind of introduced you guys to Unity, we thought it'd be really cool to show you how quick and easy it is to make prototypes of your favorite games. Uh, oh, sweet. Like Jared, what kind of games? Well, Jared and I first kind of had uh, inspiration from some of our favorite like first-person shooter games and uh, some of our favorite Nintendo 64 games. And uh, we thought it'd be really yeah, neat right. to try to make a first-person shooter that kind of had the playfulness of like a Diddy Kong Racing or Bank uh. Kazooie. <laughs> oh yeah, like all the N64 classics. Right. Oh yeah. And then, and Tune back. then we want to kind of put our own uh, twist on it by making it first-person shooter, and it, like as amped up as Halo or uh, Call of wow. Duty. And uh, whenever we're kind of making our games, we try to pull as much as we can from uh, just what we're doing when we're playing. And if you look over here. Yeah, look at how productive they're being. What's up, guys? So if you look right here, I don't know what the hell is this is. Uh, <laughs> look at this. This thing. is Jared Falcon oh, flying Halo. But uh, can we, can we if you this? notice on some of the uh, the monkey shooter game, the uh, a lot of the HUD is drawn from some of the stuff in Halo, like the crosshairs and uh, like the RB. That pops up. Right, when that pops up too. And also, one of the big things is the weapon swapping. We thought it'd be really neat to not try to reinvent the wheel. People are familiar with the way they play first in person shooters, and they're really picky on uh, yeah, just little things like that. So we're like, well, let's not try to do something completely different away from the norm and maybe do that more with like our art style or some mm -hmm. cool like weapons and stuff in the game. But as far as the basic mechanics, do like Halo. And so, like, Unity lets you guys prototype this rapidly I mean you guys can throw this to get something like this get together pretty quickly definitely uh, wow it's so easy to just drop stuff into the game and start uh, attaching scripts to it and giving it functionality and it was really easy for us to just you know use basic cubes and spheres uh, running around in like a great level well I mean the community already has a lot of support for uh, scripts that other people have written for instance like with the battle rifle here you can see me zooming in and out and out on uh, Unity's forum, you can just go out there and they have something for uh, zooming and looking down the sights. It's ready to go. All you have to do is kind of plug in the script behavior, make sure it's triggering at the right, right time, and I mean, it works. It's really that easy. And it's just a great tool to get started with. If uh, you have questions, they have a forum out there. They also have a IRC chat you can get involved with. It's just really a great tool for uh, rapid prototypes. I just got hit by a ghost with no one in it. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Fail! <laughs> So the development for Primat Shooter is kind of at a standstill right now. We stopped development when we realized that we were having a lot of problems with multiplayer networking. We were having problems for server support and just finding something that was extremely stable. But look for us to continue development for Primat Shooter in the near future. So one of the biggest pins in the ass with my previous level editor endeavors was the editor engine synchronization. Marcel? Working on the editing again, as oh, usual. Oh, bull! You mean doing nothing as usual? So once again, I gotta resync it because you guys decided to add stuff to the engine. So apparently, Peter and Papa decided to switch things up on me. Mm -hmm. uh, they added camera. We, yeah, we decided to work on the game. Pretty much. They added camera coordinates to the warps, so now I've gotta go through and add those and then make it all user friendly. This was because they were two totally different applications written in two different programming languages and we were constantly struggling to ensure that the level editor saved things out correctly and that the engine loaded things properly. And because of this, we were if we were to change one small thing in either, this would throw the synchronization completely out of whack and screw up all of our previous projects and levels. Hi, don't do the warp thing. We just need the tile. He's gonna ship the level and then every warp is gonna level be off. Right now, it needs to be shifted. All the warps are gonna be off. No okay, words. so he's gonna make a Perl script for one level. Yes. <laughs> so the great editor engine synchronization issue was definitely the biggest factor that hindered our previous development endeavors. Marcel and I spent literally weeks trying to figure out how to solve this great issue when he started his new toolkit. Um, the solution came in the form of what I like to call the joint asset I.O. framework. Essentially, the Joint Asset I.O. framework is a shared code base between the engine and the editor or toolkit that allows them to share code for loading, saving, serializing, deserializing entities, and the maps that these entities inhabit. So, there are two distinctly different types of data that comprise the level of Lysian Shadows. These are the terrain layer, which you've already seen in the toolkit as the actual tiles you place represented as a 2D array to draw the background. And there's the entity layer. Now, the entity layer 
consists of all of the things that actually have an Elysian Shadows. And this can be anything from a simple Rex to a complicated NPC, treasure, playable character, warp, all depending on what components you attach to that respective entity. Component is the base abstract class that every other component must inherit from. It contains several purely virtual functions for adding, removing, and managing itself. The two most important functions to note here are load and save, which every component must implement. When an entity is loaded or saved, it iterates through a list of attached components and invokes their respective load or save functions for deserialization and serialization when a map is either loaded or saved. The next layer of abstraction exists both in the engine as well as the level editor. We will refer to this as the editor component level. Let's use a sprite component as an example and walk you through its construction. Here you can see that it contains data that is vital to any sprite. These sprite attributes contain information such as where the sheet is located, the dimensions of the sheet, and how the sheet should be split up. This data is required to be loaded for both the engine and editor to utilize this component. The next layer of abstraction exists purely within the engine. We will refer to this as the engine component layer of abstraction. In our sprite example, this layer contains properties of the component that are runtime only and aren't necessary from within Marcel's toolkit. Here you can see functions such as play animation, stop animation, is active, and update that dictate how the component should behave at runtime while the actual game is playing. All right, so this is a QT Creator, QT's IDE. It's actually pretty nice for those of you who haven't used it. But uh, here's all the source to the toolkits. The .h is up here, the .cpp is down here. But if you notice these folders, these are actually linking relatively to the source of the engine. This is where the asset I/O lies, all this shared source. Here's all the headers and the source. So here's Falco's code, and here's my code. It's pretty cool, isn't it? So you're going to be showing us the asset I have from Mac or Windows? All right, look, real men dual wield operating systems. So I guess I'll <laughs> oh. show it to you on both. Okay. All right, so uh, from an Xcode perspective, actually they're both the same, Visual Studio and Xcode projects. I have them literally identical, but mm -hmm. I have it separated the headers and sources into asset, component, core, and system. The asset is actually the joint asset I/O or a CCIO framework. You can see it here in Xcode, and you can also see it here in uh, Visual Studio. So here is the Asicio and all the joint files. Wow, that's pretty damn sweet. I personally enjoy referring to the Joint Asset I.O. Framework as Asicio, simply because it's every bit as fulfilling as receiving fellatio. So we spent a considerable amount of time addressing the component system and the Asset I.O. system from a lower level software standpoint. And now that it's four in the fucking morning and everybody here is half asleep, we're finally ready to walk you guys through the design and implementation phase of a component. So Tyler and I here are working on right now an animation component, and Tyler can fill you in on that. Basically what we're going to be able to do is when you move down, for example, it's going to cycle through these animations. You go with that frame, that frame, that frame, that frame, and then loop back around. Same thing for when you're going up, down, left, and right. You're going to need to be able to tie the directions, the sequence of animations to an entity. So it's about 2.30 in the morning right now. I thought I'd pick up the camera and check out what the ES team's working on. So what are y'all working on right now? Oh, dude, I'm working on the animation component. Oh, yeah, 2.30. Mm -hmm. That's how we do it here. 2.30. I'm working on uh, multiple selections. So I can select like five things at a time or something for the artists or whatever. Wait, wait, wait. Someone's never in here? <laughs> not at the Balmer's Peak. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was serious. <laughs> Dude, Balmer's Peak's not till 4.30. 151? <laughs> That's like the blackout peak.
Alright, so what the hell are you guys up to since I noticed Marcel's no longer working on the toolkit? I am being productive. I see Mario 64 over here. No, are you a part of this? Me and Marcel have been sitting down for the last <laughs> hour or two, kind of work, trying to iron out a controller for a prototype Jared and I have been working on that's similar to Mario Kart. I kind of had the inspiration one day sitting in class playing Mario Kart on an N64 emulator. We thought about trying to recreate that in Unity. And me and Marcel now are sitting down and kind of testing out some of the things you can do. Like sure. when you jump, <laughs> the, uh, oh, yeah. get the speed. Check this out. Like when you're jumping, well. there's a quick speed drop over there. That's because of the coefficient of friction for what, like when you let go of the accelerator, it's still being applied for that frame. Right. But you're in the air. We'll test that out. Oh, wow. Well, very but, observational of you. Then, uh, one thing I don't think we're going to do, but this little braking mechanism, I think that that's just a, hold on. This thing, I think yeah, that's, that's, that's just. just a, <laughs> Right. We're also testing too, like to see how high your jump is based on if you're like at max speed or if you're moving, if you're not moving at all, and how high in relation it is to like certain objects and kind of get an idea before we start like making our own levels. So, what are you up to, Jared? Oh, uh, right now I'm working on just different little things with the vehicle. So, notice at the middle of the screen there's a number that's tracking my current velocity. Oh, yeah. It's right there. Yeah, right there in the middle Can of the line. Can you lines. full screen that? Yeah, I'll full screen it real quick. Now, uh, what I'm testing... There we go. Yeah, if you've played Mario Kart before, you'll notice that when you hold down the gas and the brake at the same time, you stall at whatever your current speed is, or maybe a little bit below. So right now, I'm holding both keys down for the brake and for the gas, and I'm stalled out at about 30 miles per hour. So that's one thing I'm looking at. I'm also testing if I can get to a max speed in reverse, and it stalls right there at 10, and at max speed going forward at about 35. Nice, dude. I noticed the textures are like exactly from the 64 pretty much. Look at that. Oh yeah. Uh, one of the things that we did when we were developing this project is we wanted a realistic look at how our vehicle is going to handle oh on an actual track. Now, if you were just testing this like we were initially on random created geometry, you have no idea, you know, you can't really code in things like checkpoints, laps, all that kind of stuff. So with this Luigi Mo uh, Raceway uh, replica, we really get a good idea and feel for of you know time if we're moving too fast, moving too slow, how big things should be, and uh, it really gives us a better uh, you know look for the game. These initial sketches done by Casey Kovach sought to bring a little personality to the monkey cast. With these concepts in place, even a little of the monkey fever spread into our other prototypes. Following these sketches, John Crabtree and I began development on in-game GUI power-ups, and level design. Many of the power-ups started on the whiteboard and made their way into Photoshop files. At this point in the project, art content is always being tweaked as we look to iron out more issues with vehicle control, since that is the most important part of the kart racer. So James, uh, why don't you fill us in on what you're working on for Primate Racing? Sure. Uh, so right now I'm working on a system in the game that will record and communicate to all the players what position they're actually in. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be some kind of scriptable object that's in the scene that manages the player's positions during the race. So, see, I'm wondering how exactly that works. So he's laying planes as... Yeah, why don't, why don't you show us, James? What do you got going on over here? Oh, okay. How does this work? Right, so what it is is it's kind of a three-tier system. When we thought about how it would keep up with all the, uh, the player's positions, we we're like, well... First off, we'll keep up with what lap they're on. And so that's kind of like the first tier. So if you're on the third lap then, and everybody else is on their second lap, then you're in first and then everybody else trickles down. Uh -huh. And then our second tier would be checkpoints. And so I've kind of set up these checkpoints all throughout the scene. Are those those white boxes that I'm seeing? Right, these white planes and then they have this. Let me turn off the mesh real quick. So you can just see the little arrows. Oh, those little yellow arrows? Right, so these okay. little arrows are all checkpoints that go throughout the course, and if the race manager has to uh, distinguish, like the, there's two players that are on the same lap, then it's like, well, who's, who's first and who's second? Then it goes to checkpoints. Okay. So whoever's on the furthest checkpoint. And then the third tier, the final tier, is if they're both on the same lap and on the same checkpoint, then the third tier is what is their distance to the next checkpoint? So. Okay. That, so that's how. That's, kind of like that's the plan for three how level comparison going. On right. So it'll kind of the race manager will sort uh, first by lap, and then next by checkpoint, and then finally by the uh, distance to the next checkpoint. 